looks like I am live, finally. All right, had some tech issues trying to get some things set up, but we're going to get started here, guys. Today, we're going to be talking about the magical superpower that you need in order to be happy, okay? Um, and if you stick around, we're also going to be talking about how uh, trauma, weight, lo weight loss, and um, closing are all connected. So uh, this should be an interesting topic tonight. All right. Hey, welcome everyone on TikTok. Go ahead, tap the screen, share the live. Excited that you're here. We've got some great stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Call in, trucks, uh, Mohammed. Good to see you guys. Welcome. All right. So magical superpower you didn't know you needed to be happy. So. I know a lot of times when uh, people talk about setting goals and um, setting big goals, and that's great to have those long-term goals, those uh, future visions for yourself. Um, and if you're one of those people that you can set the goal and crush it every single time, uh, I bow down to you. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. I am one of the people that will fail a million times in order to just move one inch, right? So, um, but it's a matter of learning to be happy with that process. So, um, one of the things that I found that helps me the most, and if this is your first time joining in on my channel, um, my name is Tina, I am a happiness coach, and um, I share my experience, strength, and hope of exactly what I've been through in order to um, heal trauma, heal the things that hold me back, and this is stuff I use on a daily basis. This is not, um, I'm some perfect healed guru. I deal with this and struggle with this every day. Um, so I, I struggle with feelings of anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts and um, add on to that, I'm an empath, so I pick up other people's emotions too and sometimes it takes me a little bit to sort out, is this mine, is this somebody else's, uh, is this somebody else's energy that I'm picking up, right? So um, that can be a challenge and I didn't know that I was an empath until a couple of years ago and what all of that meant. So. And I think that's just a survival mechanism. So the stuff that I share here, guys, this is real, live, practical tools that I use myself. This is what actually works for me. Um, is it, you know, by the book technical? I don't know. Um, these are just the tools that actually help me. So hopefully with what I share that you'll be able to get something out of it and um, you'll be able to do a practical implementation of that's more important than any uh, knowledge or theory kind of thing. So practical implementation and it's always the small things that actually end up uh, moving the needle more than anything. So for me, um, you know, there's been times in my life where I'm really in a good space and I can um, set those goals and move towards them and I can do it. And especially if it's for somebody else. If it's for me, that's where the challenge comes in. And um, that is what has been my challenge as an online coach, entrepreneur, um, those kind of things. It's the what drives me crazy is these are things, hey Peter, good to see you. Uh, these are things that I know that if I was working for somebody else, it would be just done. Somebody would say, go do this and I'd have no fear, no anxiety, no nothing. I would just go do what I need to do for that person because that's my job kind of thing. Um, doing that for myself has been a huge friggin' challenge, huge challenge. Um, and I'm getting better at it, but I'm using the same principles that I used when I was starting in my first uh, early recovery and when I had to revisit this as well a couple of years ago. So one thing that I found that is actually helpful for me is um, the concept of stacking success. Um, so in, especially if you are in that depressed state where everything that you do feels like you are like 
trying to run a marathon through water and you just can't see and you've got like cement blocks on your feet and it just everything just takes so much friggin effort um just sometimes getting up and showering and getting dressed is exhausting so if if you're in that kind of state this is pay attention because this is going to be helpful for you um, especially as you're going through things and it just doesn't feel like you're you're getting anywhere that you've gotten any traction that um, you're not see, seeing any benefits of what you're doing um, what I found for me helps the most is actually just picking one small thing that I can move forward in and so whenever I've tried to make big radical changes, um, those don't go so well for me um, because, but the times that I have been the most successful and the most happy with my progress are the times where I've just, there was no written plan, there's no structure, there's no nothing. It's like, you know what, um, I'm going to implement this one thing, this one small thing and I'm just going to start doing it. So example, um, years ago, I um, was fed up with being 300 pounds and I went on a low carb diet and I didn't wait for Monday. I didn't try to clean everything out of the fridge. I just started that day and I was like, you know what? Fine. Okay. I have to eat meat and vegetables. That's, that's what I need to focus on. That's easy. That's simple. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to track anything. I didn't have to measure anything. I just had to, okay, just stop doing these things. So that worked for me. And I had lost um, about 80 pounds doing that over like, uh, I think a span of six months. Now I only got so far, but for the first time in my life, I had kept that weight off for two years. That, that alone was a miracle. Um, so, when you're thinking of your success and your happiness, the stuff that you do that is smaller uh, implementation, smaller consistent application that you can apply every single day, those are the things that will actually uh, build your success faster and have it long term rather than having these big spikes of, you know, really, really high highs and then low lows because um, I don't know about you, but when those lows get low, they get really friggin' low, and then that can be challenging to try and get back up. So it's like if you have this as your surface level, and then you kind of skyrocket up, and then when you come back down, you end up going below the ground level, and then you have to crawl your way back up just to surface level again. And that has been my experience when I rise too quickly that I will fall, right? Uh, the faster I do go up, the faster I fall, and the harder uh, that fall is. And I look at it, it's like um, it knocks the wind out of your lungs, and uh, it kind of dazes you and makes you stagger that it's difficult to kind of get yourself back up, to get yourself back on your feet. So if you're in that particular stage, what I want you to do is to focus on what small thing you can do to start to move the needle forward to just do something that's <laughs> easy and consistent. Katie, come on. <laughs> she got to yell. <laughs> they got to yell once I start the live <laughs> so they can get integrated in it, right? Um, so those are the things that actually help me. And it'll feel like the stuff that you're doing isn't actually making a difference. And um, I know myself, I question that myself. So last night, example, like, and especially the last couple of days, I've been feeling a lot of um, physical pain, inflammation, um, and just like generally like all over my body, just having trouble moving a lot. And, um, and so trying to push through that when you're feeling all of this pain um, and try to be optimistic or happy or, or just even try to get some progress going um, can be a challenge when you're feeling this physical pain. And um, so what I've done is like I focus on 
what's the smallest thing that I can do to kind of push forward? So, and I take it one step at a time because if I get stuck in my head of, um, oh, I'm going to have to do this for the rest of my life and, uh, you know, this is too hard, it's so painful, I'm so sore, all of that kind of stuff, you'll end up talking yourself out of it. And I've done that in the past many times before where I talk myself out of it. And um, what works for me is playing a game with myself of just telling myself, okay, you know what, you, you just have to you just have to do it like this one last time just just one last time focus on doing that um, focus on just do this one last workout and then if you don't feel like doing it tomorrow you don't have to so um, I gasolate myself in a positive way because I know I'm going to do it again tomorrow and I'll tell myself the same thing the problem is is if I try to allow too many days to gang up on me um, instead of focusing on taking it like a day at a time um, and just focusing just for today. I'm just going to do this for today and not worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, whether or not I'm going to reach my goal, any of that kind of stuff. If I focus on that, uh, <laughs> I will pull myself out of the situation and then I don't follow through and then I end up beating up on myself and then there's this whole downward spiral. And... Um, so it's those tiny little things of allowing myself um, to be okay with growing at a slower pace if, as long as I'm still moving forward. That is better than not growing at all. Um, so a slow and steady climb versus a roller coaster. And why this is actually a good thing is think of any, any business that uh, exists, right? Do you want a business that's doing 100K one month, uh, 0K for the next three months, and then 50K, and then 10K, and then all over the place, you're up and down? That is extremely stressful. Whereas if you have a business that is sustainable, predictable, and consistent, um, it's boring. <laughs> it's not as exciting. Uh, nobody wants to hear it's like, oh, you know, for the third month in a row, I've made 5k or, you know, for the whatever it is that you're doing. Um, steady, consistent seems boring. Um, and so, yes, you can grow faster. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. There's lots of uh, mentors that out there that can help you do that. Um, but if you're one of those people that, like me, you got stuck and you struggled and you can't seem to get yourself back up on your feet, then um, trying this slower approach, slow and steady, um, allows you to keep moving forward. And it's kind of like a gradual incline. So if you're like at this part, and you're kind of going up, it doesn't seem like you've made so much progress, but as you kind of go up the incline, you start to see the difference in elevation. Um, but if you just focus on where you're at, it may not seem like you're making a lot of progress or making a lot of difference. So for example, um, with the workouts and the weight loss and stuff like that, um, uh, that I've been doing, um, I, I think it was about maybe a little over a month ago I started a different workout routine and it's really helped me and it's really uh, toned things it's tightened things but um, the friggin scale hasn't budged and I'm like you know I get on the scale and I'm like I see it's still like you know it's up up a pound down a pound I'm like you know for fuck's sake <laughs> I get mad at it because it's not moving and I know there's some things that I could tweak and that I need to modify but um, I could choose to focus on just that, the number, right? And this is where a lot of times in business this happens too, is people focus on the numbers, the KPI, but they don't see the other growth that's happening um, because it's not as measurable, right? So um, rewarding people for taking the right action and moving in the right direction uh, will give you more consistency over the long run, right? Um, more predictability. Um, 
So success in the beginning stages, it feels like it's a waste of time. And you start to question whether or not, you know, you're doing the right thing. Um, and it's a matter of not how fast, for me, it's not how fast you get the results, it's how long are those results going to stick around. That matters more than um, how quickly I can get those results because, I mean, I've been struggling with this issue for all of my life. And um, so when I go down, once I go down, I don't want to go down fast because I've tried that. I've tried every friggin' diet under the sun. I've even had weight loss surgery, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. But it wasn't until I realized that having this weight on is actually a trauma response. Uh, from childhood trauma, uh, sexual abuse, and that's not to excuse, um, like, you know, it's like, oh, Tina, that happened, like, years ago, and you're in your 50s, and you're still complaining about the same damn thing. Yes, yes, I am, because I hadn't gotten to those uh, deeper layers and understanding this, because up until now, I thought it was my lack of discipline, my lack of willpower, my lack of... Um, not doing the right things. Well, maybe I should do low carb. Maybe I should do vegan. Maybe I should do Weight Watchers. Maybe I should do all of these different things that I've tried, but I wasn't able to stay consistent with those because they were too extreme from what um, I did. And those gradual changes, doing those small changes, implementing that small change. So um, when I first started recovery, one of the things that I had read was to make sure that I ate something fresh and unprocessed every day. And I'm like, well, I, okay, I can do that. So that could be an apple, that could be some vegetables, that could be whatever. Doing that and doing that consistently and making sure I don't skip it is much more important than, well, well I can only have this much and I can only do this much. And um, now that's not saying I can go the entire time that way and as I go along and I'm sure as I get smaller I'm going to have to tweak that I'm going to have to modify that um, to get to the levels that I want to but for where I'm at right now if that still keeps me moving forward and it keeps it that I can stick with it that is much more important than um, doing something just to get it done right because I've, I've gone down in weight and then only to bounce back up even higher and I don't want that again I don't want that again I want to be able to go down and stay down to that this is who I am consistently and in order for me to achieve that I need to be that every single day and that means it has to be livable for me um, and I think that applies to business as well too that the stuff that you implement, yes, there's times where you need fast implementation, you need to do things quickly and get things done for a certain target, timeline, whatever. Um, but you can't stay in that kind of state. Um, it will burn your people out. And then you'll have a fallout, you'll have a whole bunch of turnover, and then there's all kinds of problems that come from that, right? So having a steady, consistently predictable growing business over the long haul is um, I think something that a, a business owner would want more than anything right and it also makes your business sellable <laughs> if you have uh, like you know if you show your financials for the last three years and it's all over the place it's like that's all that's going to do is bring up a bunch of questions from the potential buyer going well why were you up this high and, and now you're down low? And it's like, why? Like, I, they're going to want to see year over year uh, incremental improvements. Um, and you should be able to explain those numbers, right? Um, so striving for consistency, stability um, in your business is going to be something that's key. Um, because if not, it's just going to bring up uh, potential questions. And... Um, So, 
as you're going through and you're setting your goals, your targets, and what it is that the steps that you're going to take to be able to move forward, um, picking whatever it is that you can do to be consistent. So start by looking at, you know the things already that you need to change, right? So you don't need somebody else to tell you, eat this, don't eat that. Um, you know by paying attention to your body, to how you feel, to what's going on with you, you know that, you know, maybe I should probably eat more vegetables. And you know what? And especially if there's things that you don't like, it's like, ah, you know what? I don't like to do that. I like to, um, you know, I like to eat candy instead of fruit. It's like, I don't really like fruit. It's like, okay, well, can you like bargain with yourself. It's like, okay, if I'm going to have candy, I'm going to have a piece of fruit first. Or if I'm going to have, if I want like potatoes or rice or something like that, and you're like, oh, I don't really like eating vegetables, but you know what? In order for me to have this, I'm going to eat some broccoli first or something like that. It, like, you know, negotiate with yourself and do trade offs. It's like, of, uh, giving yourself that reward of the thing that you want, but putting the thing that you know you need first. Um, that has helped me quite a bit. Uh, so learning how to do that kind of stuff and doing that consistently. Um, and pay attention to the thoughts and the emotions that come up. Um, so as you're going through stuff, um, you might be like, well, I don't actually know what I should eat. And um, I don't know if I should do this or I should do that. And I'm not here to tell you what kind of foods to eat. I'm not a nutritionist. <laughs> um, find what works for you. Use Google. If you feel like you need a professional to help you with that, go do that as well. Um, but I find for myself, I like fruits and vegetables. I like um, lean meats and stuff like that. So, um, and I pay attention to when I get into the foods that are, I know not so great for me, but I pay attention to why am I eating those things. I pay attention to the emotions and thoughts that come up. Uh, sometimes I'm successful with um, avoiding doing that and then other times I'm not and if those times that I am not being successful at avoiding things that I know I should avoid then that is a signal to me that there's something deeper going on and it's a time for me to pause reflect and understand what is going on internally with me um, that's making it difficult because if I've known that that is a good decision, that is something that is good for me and healthy for me, and I seem to be in this self-sabotaging behavior, then that is a cue for me to slow down, to pause, to give myself care, and understand um, why I'm not doing things that are allowing me to operate in my best interest. Um, and so when I take that time and I give myself that care, um, it's it's almost like giving myself a hug <laughs> and and letting myself know that what I'm doing is okay for me. And when I do that, when I get myself in that good state, I automatically am motivated to do the right thing for myself, to do the thing that will give me the greatest benefit. But if I beat myself down and I tell myself that, oh, you're not this, you're not that, you you screwed up again, I'm being really critical with myself, I screwed everything all up. When I do that kind of stuff, then all it does is feed that negative belief and it causes me to continue down the path of destruction versus when I slow down, when I give myself what it is I need, then I am able to... I don't actually have to work at it. I don't have to, because I not, when I feel like I've been given what I need, then I automatically move forward to doing the best possible thing. So this happens as well. So anytime that you see somebody acting out, um, not behaving them, their best self, 
just know that that's a cry for love um, and they need that support they need nurturing they need caring they need understanding in those times so when we just beat ourselves up and tell ourselves that we can't do something that we're terrible we're awful um, we've screwed everything all up um, those are just past beliefs that people have projected onto us and um, because if you have, if you are in a good space and you feel loved, you feel content, you feel happy, you will automatically do the right thing and you will want to move forward because success breeds success. Um, and so stacking on success and looking for those wins, shifting your focus to finding those um, allows you to be a lot more motivated to move in that right direction and being patient with yourself when you're not in that space. So uh, most of today was a struggle for me um, and I struggled to move forward and it was challenging and I was battling feeling a lot of pain. Um, uh, physically, like my joints, everything just felt like it was on fire earlier today and I don't know if that's weather related or something else or a bunch of different things ganging up all at once because sometimes there's that. So trying to figure out what it is that's causing some of those problems um, isn't always easy either. Um, but focusing on what do I need to take that next step forward? It's like, okay, um, and pushing myself, which may not seem like a lot to somebody else, maybe looking from the outside, but for me, knowing that where I was at today, even though it's less than I do on another day, that was my 110% for earlier today. And that was a challenge just to kind of get up, get ready, and to really focus on not beating myself up for that and to give myself what it is that I need. So um, when I do that, then I'm able to appreciate the struggle. And sure, on other days, maybe I've done better. But today, this was the best that I could do. And so not beating yourself up for that is important as you're going through this journey because this is a long haul. This is a lifetime journey. This isn't, uh, you know, just do this and it's mastered and you never have to touch it again. Um, if anybody tells you that, I would say that they're full of shit. Um, so now this doesn't mean that it's always going to be so hard because as you keep doing each iteration, each layer that you go through, um, you will progress through it faster. Now the first few times you're going through it, it's going to seem like it takes a long time. But as you continue to consistently move forward and go up that incline, you will start to see the, I, I think they call it the delta, like, you know, the difference between uh, the elevation of where you're at from where you were. Um, so in the beginning, it's going to seem like slow progress and it's not going to feel like you're making any progress, but you are. And the guaranteed way to ensure that you fall back into old behaviors is beat yourself up. Guaranteed. Ask me how I know. <laughs> okay. So pay attention to um, the emotions that come up for you uh, as you're going through this they're a clue as to what it is that you need to do next. And so like I think of it, um, anything that you're finding hard and maybe maybe it's something that you were doing okay with and then you got knocked down, you got the, you know, you had one of those falls and you got the wind knocked out of you and you've, you're you dazed and you're trying to get yourself back on your feet and um, you're struggling and you're like, ah, you know what, I, I don't think this is for me. Maybe it's not for me and you're, thinking of giving up or quitting or any of those kind of things, you know, um, trying to get back in the saddle can be really, really challenging. So um, example, say uh, you're in sales and <laughs> cold calling and you're like, ah, you know, I'm traumatized from what I had to do before and this is, just seems so hard and I don't like this and, you know, you have to do that one cold call. Just do, just do the one, okay, and pay attention to the emotions and the thoughts that come up and um, 
and deal with those emotions and thoughts. Do that inner work, understand what's going on there, and then move forward, do it again. It's like, okay. But if I focus on, oh, I got to do all of these calls, and then you'll talk yourself out of it. Ask me how I know. You'll talk yourself out of it and not do the thing. Whereas, you know what? Take away the time horizon, take away the speed of it, and just focus on do the one call. Did you do it? Okay. Now, what's the feedback loop? How did that call go? I got scared and I fucking hung up as soon as I heard somebody say hello. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> why did Why did you hang up? Oh, okay. Well, I wasn't sure what to say. Okay, that is a, a clue. That's an indicator of what you need to do next. It's like, okay, so how can I make myself feel more secure so that the next time I make that call, I know what to say. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll write a couple of things down of what I need to say. Or, oh, shit, I should pull out that script that they gave me that I wasn't paying attention to. Okay, I'll, I'll do that, right? So those are the kind of things that you need to do to build yourself back up. And it's like, okay, well, the next call went, well, I was a little bit nervous and I stuttered and I, I stammered and I, I screwed up and I said their name wrong or something like that, whatever it is. Build the practice of that feedback loop of doing the thing that you're afraid of doing, just the one, not all of them, just one. Can you do one? Okay, great. You've done one. What's the feedback loop? How did you do on that one call? How, uh, how did you feel? Uh, did, you, did you know what to say? Did you think you did well? Did you think you screwed it up? Um, what could you improve on that? That is a much more important practice than going, you know what, I slammed through 100 calls and, um, well, what would you do? What would you gain from them? I don't know. I got my call. I got the numbers done. And it's like, okay, um, build that consistency of uh, the constant self-improvement, okay? That is much more valuable. Um, and although it slows things down and it's a longer ramp-up time, the amount of consistency and stability that you will build out of that and that'll be a normal practice whereas if you race through you do really well and you got your stuff done but now you don't know why you're doing what you're doing or how you got to the success that you're doing so building that up as you go um, is much more important okay building that resilience is essential part of the process um, in anything that you're doing, your inner work, your uh, relationships, your wealth, your finances, um, well, finances are the same thing, um, your business, any of those kind of things, uh, doing that slow, consistent, steady progress. Not saying that you have to go slow all the time, but if you go slow in the beginning and build the cadence that you need, then you can ramp up and you can speed up as you need to, but you also now know when you can slow down and when you need to slow down so that you can process the emotions that are coming up around it, okay? Um, because when you go really, really fast, it's like building a house of cards. It's not very stable. Um, it's gonna get knocked down and that, even that is not a bad thing because the ability to rebuild yourself is much more important than trying to do it all perfect the first time. So getting in there, screwing it up, and moving forward is much more important, right? So putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations, pushing yourself just a little bit, um, and then reflecting. But in order for the reflection to be good, you have to behave like you're your own best ally, your own best friend. Um, because if you are your own worst enemy and you're always criticizing and belittling yourself, then you will not, um, you can't grow from that. And I can promise you, if you look at why you're belittling yourself, why you're criticizing yourself, there's probably somewhere in the past somebody else has treated you like that um, and you're picking up where that uh, abuser left off and you're continuing that pattern of abuse rather than giving yourself the kindness, love, and support that you should have received in the first place. That encouragement, um, that belief 
because I strongly believe people will rise to the level of belief that you instill in them. Um, and if you believe you see the best in them, and even if they don't, and you believe it at your core, they will eventually rise to that. But if you have fears and doubts and go, you know, I don't, I don't think that they're going to be able to change, right? Um, nothing will ensure uh, your downfall, whether that's personally or professionally, um, is your inability to change. Um, that stubborn refusal to stay the same, that no, this is the way, I know that this is the way, right? Um, there's plenty of examples of businesses. Um, ask Blockbuster how their stubbornness to change uh, worked out for them. <laughs> you know, those kind of things. So our ability to adapt and grow and reflect and look at things and innovate um, is the hallmark of growth. Um, and being able to do that at a slower, steady pace is um, allows for long-term um, success. Okay, so I want to talk about um, how uh, a gastric bypass that I had. So, so tr weight obesity is a trauma response. Um, I read uh, some of the studies that they've done by uh, the doctor that wrote the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. And they did studies of um, veterans that had PTSD, and um, they were also doing another study on women who were needing to lose weight. And they found that all of the women um, that were going through the weight loss study, every single one of them had had uh, sexual abuse. And um, so they realized that these women that were struggling with obesity actually were suffering from the same symptoms of PTSD that the veterans were suffering from. And so um, looking at that, um, and when I, <laughs> when I went to start my coaching business a couple of years ago of how to help closers heal past trauma, I wanted to look some things up because I knew what worked for me, but I didn't want to lead somebody down the wrong path. So I did a, a bunch of research and I started to look things up. And then that's when I realized, oh shit, I actually have some more work to do here. And so the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of inner work and building, uh, pulling some of this stuff back up and dusting off some of the old tools that I used. Um, and uh, I so wish I knew back then what I know now. Um, that would have been so much more helpful to me. Um, I would have made some very different decisions. So back in 2002, um, I had met a guy online after uh, ending a relationship and it was a bit of a rebound. So I had ended a relationship around my birthday, which was in April. And then in June, I'm like, I had jumped back on the horse. I got online. I found a guy, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this logically. I'm not letting my heart involved, and I'm just going to do this logically. I'm going to go through this checklist of things, and I was relentless. Like, talk about being able to do, like, uh, th your outbound cold calls. Like, I was relentless going through um, uh Match.com, and that was back when you didn't meet people online because everybody online was a serial killer. So, <laughs> um, so doing this was something very different, and it was like, oh, okay, you're a smoker. No, that's not going to work for me because I used to smoke and I quit, and I don't want to. I didn't even know the stuff around environment and all of that kind of stuff, and I was like, oh, okay, I, I don't want to risk. Uh, starting smoking again so if you're a smoker I'm sure you're a great guy I don't want to try and change you or anything like um, and although he was fun and great to talk to I was like no nope, that's a deal breaker so I knew what my my bottom lines were and um, and I knew what kind of thing what I was targeting right so I was very clear on the target of what kind of person they couldn't drink they couldn't do drugs they non-smoker 
okay, you know, so I came and I was relentless. Like I was up until like two, three in the morning going through multiple outbound outreaches <laughs> of just making contact with people. So I've done this many times um, and came across a guy. Uh, we started talking. It was good um, and it was uh, pretty fun as we were talking, I was like, oh, okay, I can actually talk to this guy. And um, so we hit it off, uh, we met on Father's Day. Um, and then it was a whirlwind from then. And by August, I was engaged. Um, and that, so that was really fast, but I was okay with fast. And I figured, okay, you know what? I've done a lot of healing work. I'm 32. I know what I'm looking for. I'm not some young 18, 19, 20 year old that's, you know, trying to find somebody and you kind of need to go through this whole discovery process. I was very strategic with what I was doing. Um, but I wasn't fully healed yet. And, um, there were some things that I was ignoring. Uh, because I was so focused at the fast results because I really, really wanted a family. I really wanted to have kids. I wanted the house. I wanted, so I was, I thought I had gone through a proper vetting process. <laughs> and um, and there were some warning signs that um, I chose to ignore. And, um, but my body didn't. My body didn't. And I started to put on weight rapidly so even though I was denying what was going on with me I was putting on weight at a rapid pace and most brides as they're getting fitted for their wedding dress um, they get it taken in because they're losing weight and they're like you know all excited and happy and and I was putting on weight at a rapid pace and I thought it was oh you know what I was doing low carb and then I went off low carb and even though I was trying to eat fairly well, I was putting on weight at a rapid pace. And that continued even after we got married. And um, I went from being around 220 um, to the first couple of years of being married almost up to 400 pounds. Um, and then I ended up, um, and I tried many different things. It's like, okay, I'll go back on Weight Watchers and I do good for a little while. And I uh, lost some of the weight, and then it was back up and down, up and down, right? Um, and so as I was going through this process, um, my mom, she was wanting to lose weight, and the doctor had suggested to her to have weight loss surgery. So she went for uh, weight loss surgery, um, and... She kept encouraging me, and at the time, I knew, I knew there was something that wasn't good. It wasn't right. I knew. I'm like, no, that's that's like a quick fix. Why can't? I didn't understand why I couldn't solve this problem. Why couldn't I get this weight off? Why couldn't I do this consistently? Because there'd be times I'd just go like so hardcore, I'd stick to it religiously, faithfully, and I wouldn't deviate. And nothing would change. And I would like get so frustrated and discouraged. And then, you know, after about seven, eight months of like nothing happening, then I just like throw in the towel. It's like, you can't beat them, join them kind of thing. Um, because I, I knew that there was some sort of emotional connection. I knew that this was more mind than matter, you know, um, and I just didn't understand what was behind it. But eventually I ended up giving in and I went through the process and I went and I had weight loss surgery um, and even going on um, an ex so I'm 400 pounds. Okay, get this, guys. Okay, I'm 400 pounds. I go on a strict 1,200 calorie a day liquid diet before the surgery. And all I dropped in that entire month was 20 pounds. That's it. That should have dropped a whole lot more. But my body was resistant. Why? Because it was a trauma response. There was... There was stress and trauma and undealt with emotions that I hadn't dealt with. I should have dropped a whole lot more weight. So I dropped 20 pounds 
go for the surgery and you have to go through all of this psychological screening process to make sure that you're actually ready, that you've tried a bunch of different things. And I'm like, well, you know, I've tried a whole lifetime of different things. And um, after you have the surgery, you have to go in for uh, checkups, like follow-ups, and you had to commit to those kind of things of ensuring that you went back for the follow-up so that they could study and document the process of that this actually works. And um, I remember in going back for one of my check-ins, and this is why it's so important when you're going through this um, validation process that you do some of that inner work and it's not just going through checking the boxes, okay? Because here's the thing, so when I came back in for one of my check-ins, um, because I hadn't done the inner work, it's like uh, your life or your dysfunction will find another way. So before, I used to eat like a lot of um, fatty or greasy foods. And one of the side effects of the gastric bypass that I had was I couldn't eat those foods. They made me physically ill so that I, um, there's this uh, symptom that you get called dumping syndrome, dumping syndrome, where your heart will start to race if you eat too much sugar or um, um, sugar, fat, or alcohol. Any of those, they, um, because your body is surgically altered, um, it those things go into your bloodstream a lot faster. And what it'll do is it'll cause your heart to race. Um, it'll cause you to have the shakes and sweats and stuff like that. Um, and I found that what happened is if I ate greasy food, um, I'd get like these heart palpitations afterwards and like my heart would race and I was wearing a Fitbit at the time and it would be telling me, <laughs> telling me that I, um, my heart rate was like I was doing too intense of a workout <laughs> and I was sitting there and I had just finished eating some chicken wings and even though it was less than what I had ever eaten before, um, it caused this physical reaction in me. And I was like, okay, this cannot be good. Um, did it stop me from doing that? No, not always, but sometimes it did because it made me feel really, really sick. Um, so, but what it ended up happening is because I still have, if you don't deal with the root cause of the problem, which was the emotional issues that were behind why the weight is there, if I didn't do that work, then that's still there. And just because you cut off that one option, guess what? It's going to find another way to express itself. So I started developing um, cravings for sugar that I never really had. Like I never liked uh, sweet sugary candies. Um, I started doing uh, cake decorating and I was like, what the hell is this, right? You know, so I developed this, um, like, when we were kids, like my brother, he would go for things like uh, bottle caps, sweet tarts, uh, sugary powders, licorice, gummies, all those kind of, it's just pure sugar kind of thing. Whereas I preferred things like, you know, that had nuts and chocolate um, or fruit and chocolate or something like that or chips. I'd go for that kind of stuff. Um, and I never really liked all that, like pixie sticks and all of that pure sugar kind of thing. But after the surgery, I switched and I started developing cravings for that kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, this is weird. I've never liked this stuff before, but I needed a different way to kind of get that same fix, I guess. I guess that's what it is, if you could call it that fix. And it's because I hadn't done the emotional work around it. So when I went back in for the follow-ups and they're asking what I was eating and they were concerned that I wasn't losing as quickly as I should have been and even though meals I was keeping low and all that kind of stuff, um, one of the things that I did have every day was I did have chocolate. 
And here's the thing, and this ties to closing. This is where it starts tying with closing. So when I said, hey, I'm eating chocolate every day, I got this look like, yeah, you're going to be a failure. You're going to be a failure. And she didn't really try to question or try to seek to understand why I was doing it. And here's the thing, guys, is I really needed that support. But I was being defiant also. I was like, no, I'm good with it. There's nothing wrong. I'm only having like two squares of dark chocolate. What's the problem, right? Um, but she didn't try to challenge or question. Not challenge. She didn't try to seek to understand why that was important for me or try to get to the emotions behind it. It came off more like, hey, you're going to be one of the ones that fucks up our numbers. You're going to be one of the ones that's a failure. But the thing is, is I really could have been closed, and she didn't try to understand why. So as I started to get down to lower weights, and I was around 220, which is pretty good coming from 400 pounds, right? So getting down to about 220, one of the challenges that had come up was um, my libido started to come back. And that was a huge problem because my marriage was not actually good in that area. Um, and so when I started to try and reach out for physical attention for my husband, um, that was shot down. Um, and in fact, sometimes he'd flinch. Um, and so that was actually very, very painful um, in dealing with that. And I couldn't. And that was also part of the reason why the weight came on so quickly is because things got cut off very quickly after we got married. Um, and so because of that, and I was told, hey, you just need to calm down. It's, it's not that we're not dating anymore. We don't have to be like that. And I'm like, but we're newlyweds and I want to have kids. <laughs> so we can't have kids if we don't do the thing, right? So um, so I just assumed it was me that I was the problem and I tried all different things and all of that kind of stuff. But that was an issue that even after, years afterwards, I didn't understand. Um, and I couldn't talk about it either. I had no one that I could really talk about that kind of stuff with. And um, just know that if somebody is acting out and they seem to be acting in self-sabotaging behavior, just know there's a great deal of pain behind them behaving that way. Um, and taking that time to understand is really, really important. And so this applies in closing as well, too. Like if somebody is giving you objections, it's not the lines, it's not the script, it's not the technique. You've got a human being sitting across from you that's actually in pain, um, but they're too afraid to talk about it. So you building trust, hey Mark, good to see you. Um, you building that trust with them, giving them that safe place to actually open up is so much more important. That's what real closing is about. It's really understanding and helping somebody feel safe enough to actually open up and talk about what's going on with them, why this is even a problem, even if that means you figure out, oh, I'm so glad that you're here as well, Mark. Uh, it's always good to see friendly faces. Um, even if um, you're going through the situation and they end up deciding that the service isn't what they actually need, right? So example, I didn't need gastric bypass surgery. I needed to understand the emotions behind it because although I dropped down to 220, I from 400 pounds, I dropped down to 220, I bounced back up because once I realized that I needed physical attention and I wanted, and then the weight was there to hold back that physical attention that I was craving, that I was needing. And um, 
not getting that was extremely painful and it was a matter of what's the point of losing weight and looking good if I am in a marriage where I'm not being physically touched. Um, and even though we were good friends and stuff like that, it was something that was um, almost never initiated by my husband. And I know that's pretty open, vulnerable stuff that I'm talking about here, but those are the things it, that that was the core root of the problem of why I wasn't able to lose that weight. And I believe that it was all on me, that there was something I was doing wrong, that, oh, it's because I gained the weight. And it was other things that were going on before the marriage, the red flags that I saw, but I didn't, um, I had already committed and I was engaged. And so I couldn't break my word. So there's some certain things that were, um, I call them as uh, your core programming, and those functions will override, and other people might think that um, you're just self-sabotaging, but I knew if I lost the weight and I had this high libido, I didn't want to end up cheating on my husband. That was devastating for me, so it was easier just to be fat, and then I don't have to deal with any of those things, because being fat keeps people away from you. And that's an effective tool, and it's a easy way to keep guys away. And then if they do show you attention, even if you are heavy, it's like, well, shit, now i got to gain more weight. Now, this is not something that's conscious, but it wasn't until I started to do some of this healing work and realized the connection of a, a trauma response with obesity and making that connection, then I realized it's like, oh, shit, that's actually what's going on with me. I don't want, because of the abuse that I've been through and because of what my abuser did and called me names and all those kind of things, I did not want to be perceived as um, the slut <laughs> that likes attention and all of this kind of stuff that I asked for it and all of these things that were extremely painful to go through I didn't make that connection I didn't make the correlation um, so just eating my way through those feelings and not knowing what to do around it were part of the challenge so and this abuse kind of gets compounded and gets reinforced in different ways too so And the, the other thing before I get into that, so when I was going back for the reassessments uh, after the weight loss surgery and those looks of disappointment that they gave me around um, not losing the weight, um, which, why would you be surprised that somebody that you have to do psychological screening for before they have the surgery, why would you be surprised that they struggle with it mentally afterwards, that they have some challenges with it and not provide that support and this is where I get frustrated because it focuses more on the KPIs and the data because the only reason they're doing the follow-up is a cover your ass thing of proving that the surgery works and then the being disapproving of it caused people to not keep coming back to get the support that they actually needed and Part of the reason why is because if they actually gave them that mental emotional support, they would realize they didn't need the friggin' surgery in the first place. They needed the emotional support. They needed to be able to do that inner work. And when they get are given that love, that support, that understanding, um, you can't make a whole lot of money off of that. They can't charge for the surgeries and all of those kind of things. Um, and I only went through with it because it was a last-ditch effort of hoping that I'd be able to have kids only to find out that uh, I had to face the reality that my marriage was not where I wanted it to be. And that was back in 2010 when I did that. And uh, things escalated from there that um, I did a lot of things and I compromised my values on things that um, in hopes of trying to get that um, attention 
that I was craving from my husband. Um, and this is stuff that people on the outside, they did not see any of the stuff because what they saw were uh, two friends that kind of, you know, we hung out together, we had fun together, we did, you know, we went on all kinds of adventures, which was great that we did those things. Um, and that was great friends, but we were not husband and wife because that requires physical intimacy, right? Um, and losing that connection uh, very early on in the marriage was uh, very painful. And I thought it was just me this whole time. So um, one of the other things that ended up happening, so after, you know, a few years of after the gastric bypass surgery, sorry, I'm just fixing my glasses here. So my name's off here. There we go. Okay, making me do a screen thing. <laughs> um, so going through these challenges, um, being obese and just trying to get medical assistance um, in any way, you're treated uh, like a lesser citizen, <laughs> like you're less than, you're defective, dysfunction, dysfunctional. Um, you're treated like this is your fault. And um, yes, I understand that we have choices with what we eat and what we work out with and um, all of those kind of things. But for somebody that like me, that many, many times I took that responsibility, I went with it, I did it that wasn't the problem it was i can't get rid of that protection mechanism i needed that safety right um so going to a doctor so i had been looking for um a new family doctor there had been a walking clinic close to us and i got to see many of the different doctors in the clinic for refills on prescriptions, but I knew I needed to see a family doctor again. And um, so there was this one doctor, he was really nice, really kind to me. Um, and he was very understanding and he took extra time to listen when I was going through the walk-in clinic. So um, when he had put that he was um, looking for uh, new patients as a family doctor, I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, and the funny thing is, is which is really funny that I, I see this, but this guy was like buff. Like, my God, he was he was tall, dark, handsome, buff, like really muscular. And I had never really seen that with a doctor before. Like, I've never really seen a really well-built, like, I mean, like this guy was like Alex Ramosi, like kind of muscles, right? And I was like, okay, like, I have eyes, I can see, and I thought he was attractive, but that wasn't why I picked him as a doctor. Um, in fact, that almost caused me not to pick him as a doctor, but he was actually really kind. He was kind, caring, and understanding, and so I felt safe talking to him and opening up, and I thought he would actually be able to give me the support that I needed. The funny thing is, as soon as he took me on as a, like my family doctor, all of that kindness, patience, and understanding went out the window. And it was a completely different switch up once I was his, um, once he was my family doctor. And so I had to go for a physical and um, he, he had asked about my history and I told him about the gastric bypass. And of course, somebody who's fit and buff and he's worked that hard to look that way um, is not going to appreciate uh, somebody who took a shortcut with a surgery and still didn't get to the end result. And he's like, oh, I guess that failed. And that was so painful that he did that. And at the time, I took that personally, that I was the failure. 
So again, this doesn't help the fact that I already had issues of not being able to go to the gym because the whole point people are going to the gym is not to be looking like the person I am, right? So that was so much shame that I carried and it was hard to go to the gym and you were looked at, made fun of when you actually went to the gym. It's like, oh, it's about time you got here kind of thing. It's like, well, yeah. So I do my workouts at home still to this day. Um, although I'm not as afraid as I used to be about going to the gym. But either way, so what ended up happening is this whole transactional thing ended up happening on the back end and it flipped and it was like this ended up being another example of not getting the support and it was criticism and it was judgment and not seeking to understand why I had that problem with the weight, why I was doing that. Because if anybody had taken the time, I was in so much pain at those times, I it all would have came out. And I think part of that is something that of why they didn't do that why they didn't ask those questions. And I think sometimes closers do this as well, or sales reps or any profession where you're supposed to be able to help uh, somebody, right? Being able to be there for them and be that safe space for them so that they can open up and talk about what it is that they're going through, why they're doing it. Because when somebody gets that clarity and then they have that support and they have somebody else who actually believes in them, they will rise to that level. And how I know that is because when in 2021 I hired a coach and I was finally able to get some support and I actually opened up about some of the things that I was too afraid to talk about without even trying I had dropped like 50 pounds and I was like okay I'm not even dieting I'm, I'm not even working out but I felt safe I felt supported and because of that, I chose different foods naturally because I felt good about myself. I felt capable. I felt happy. I felt confident. And I felt supported. And I started to drop the weight. And I ended up basically dropping over 100 pounds because of feeling that support and feeling like I was finally good enough and that getting that encouragement meant the world to me. And if you are looking for a coach like that, there's nobody that has been more consistent, more dedicated than the coach that I had. And that was Phil Bohol. And I would strongly recommend that you check out his YouTube channel. He's got some training there. He has been super supportive. And with my dying breath, I will always back him up. Okay. Um, so head over there and check out his channel because he has been a big life changer for me and um, I am always grateful for everything that he's done. Okay, so, um, so going back to this doctor, um, those feelings of making me feel like a failure just re-solidified. Now, all of this stems back from the trauma that I experienced as a child. And as I've done more and more inner work, I understand why it is, why I was doing what I was doing. And um, when I focus on ensuring that I make myself feel safe, protected, secure, then that weight comes off. I sleep better, I eat better, I drink more water, I do the things because I want to do that, because I'm motivated to do that, because I feel like I deserve that better life. But if I am beating up on myself, I'm being, other people are being critical and judgmental of me, then it just reinforces the belief that I don't deserve to live in a ha happy, healthy body. And, um, and feeling like I have some sort of protection as well. 
So knowing that I'm better at setting boundaries now, I'm better at being able to tell somebody to fuck off if they're in my space. <laughs> While some people may not like that part of me, I freaking love that part of me now that I can actually stand up for myself and speak up for myself and value myself and um, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gotten the support that I got from Phil. I know I did the work. I know I did the work. So it's not like But just knowing that he was consistent, he was um, disciplined, and he always had my best interest at heart. Um, he was an anchor for me, and I am very, very grateful for what he's done, because I wouldn't have been able to feel the way that I feel and be taking these steps, even though some of this journey has been extremely painful. The support that he gave me during the time that I was coaching with him, even in my hardest times, his voice would come back. He made a difference in my life, and I'm grateful for that. Um, so check out his channel, subscribe. Give him some love because I think he's having a hard time right now. I don't know what's going on with him, but I know there's some challenges he's going through. So I encourage you to go over there and give him some love because this man I respect. So, and that's not something that's easy to gain for me. I love everybody, but to gain my respect, that takes a whole other level. So. Make sure, because he he always encouraged us to make sure that you are there for the person, that there's a person that you're helping. You're not closing just for a sale, for a money. That you will follow through, that you will do the things that you say that you're going to do. And I thought I was pretty high caliber, and then I met him, and I was like, shit, I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> And um, and I know he probably doesn't think that he's done that, but he has. And making sure that uh, you don't let the people that are with you fall through the cracks is something that's really important. Okay, because then they just feel like it's a transaction. So whatever. However nurturing and understanding your salespeople are, there's a whole other level beyond sales that has to happen. Your operations, the people in the background, have to care even more than the sales team. They have to be able to nurture and love the people that your sales team brings in at a whole other level. That has to be an unconditional, unwavering love and support so that they sing the praises of your company, your business, um, that they get the growth that they were looking for when they signed up with your company. And I think a lot of companies, if you look at your, um, see, they always focus on the, the close ratio and everything. What's your success ratio from the people that you bring in? What's the success ratio? of how happy the people are, not only after you just brought them in in their first 90 days when they're still on that honeymoon high, where are they at afterwards? Did you stick with it? Were you that anchor? Were you that beacon? Did you follow through? That is something that is way more important for the sustainability of a business. And even when your client is difficult and a pain in the ass and stubborn, like me, <laughs> I 
I'm sure Phil has probably got some gray hairs he never had before. <laughs> I've aged that poor guy. <laughs> but Phil, he definitely helped. And I'm forever grateful. So, guys, with that, make sure that um, the fastest path to happiness is taking those small steps. That consistent improvement over a long enough period of time. And when you surround yourself with people that actually believe in you, people that are working towards improving themselves and developing that kind of community, then you will succeed in that community when you get the right support around you. It can change your life and you can find happiness and um, yeah slow and steady wins the race right and when you slow down enough to do that inner work to look within to figure out what's going on with you and really understand that that's how you can actually move forward and when you do that with enough consistency, you'll get to your goal, no matter what. Okay? So, guys, I'm going to wrap this up tonight. I will be on again tomorrow. I will be uploading the um, recording on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope that you were able to gain some sort of insight, some sort of awareness, uh, something that you can implement today. Um, into your life what's one small thing that you know that you haven't been doing thanks mark good to see you again it's so so encouraging to have a familiar face as i'm talking here and just not just myself so thank you for coming back and listening so guys pick one thing one thing that you could do that you can do consistently on a daily basis even on the days that you don't want to uh, whether that's drinking water, um, eating something fresh and unprocessed, uh, going to bed at a regular time, or um, getting some fresh air or sunlight, whatever it is, like some small incremental improvement that you know that when you're feeling your happiest, you do easily. But when you're in this uh, depressive or anxious state, it feels like a monumental task find that one thing just one thing and do that consistently until you don't have to think about it and then when you stop thinking about it that it's a something that you have to do and make sure that you do and it's now just something of this is who you are that's when you pick something else right now if you're feeling good and you're in a good space and you feel you can take some stuff on Great, take that on. I'm not trying to slow you down, but your ability to stay consistent with it is much more important than your speed. Okay? We're going for long term, life changing results. So find something, just one little thing to be consistent with. Okay? And do that on a daily basis. All right? And Focus. If you're finding that yourself overwhelmed and you're like, oh, I can't do this for the rest of my life. I need to do it. One day at a time. And if you screw up and you miss it, guess what? You get a fresh start tomorrow. New slate. Take every day just as one day. Can I do this for one day, right? And I know there's times where I'm doing my workouts, especially with the physical pain that I've been feeling over the past few days and I'm doing the workout and I'm like fuck oh, man this is this is too hard I don't want to do this and I'm like really really you you can't you can't do this like like lift your leg and it's like okay you did one okay can you do like for 30 seconds because that's all it's asking just do 30 seconds of it okay and now it's like okay now you have the next exercise okay you're going like this okay great <laughs> can you do that for 30 seconds Okay, take it 30 seconds at a time if you have to. Whatever you need to do, 
and give yourself credit for pushing when you didn't want to. Give yourself grace for the times where you're like, I just don't have it in me. I'm not doing it today. Allow yourself that permission because you don't want to do it because you're forcing yourself because that comes from a fear-based mentality. If you're like, you know what? No, I actually need a bit of downtime. I Like, this is actually killing my knee. And if I keep pushing it, it's going to cause a problem with my knee. So how do I modify it? Well, I could do this instead. Finding that alternate route to still keep you moving forward is much more important than just, no, I got to do it. Don't hurt yourself in the process. Do this as a reward of, as an expression of love for yourself, not out of hate that you weren't good enough. It is much more sustainable. It's much more long-term, and it will build you up instead of tearing you down that you're doing this because you are deserving, not because you're not good enough, okay? It's a slight shift in focus. It's a slight shift in perspective, but that's where the miracles occur. A shift in perspective is a miracle. When we see this from a viewpoint of love and giving ourselves the love we should have had in the first place, that is what is doing the healing inner work. That's where happiness comes from. When we continue the abuse and the criticism and the fear and the hate that we received growing up in childhood or anywhere along our lives. That's not how we're wired. Would you treat your child that way? Would you talk to your child in the manner that you've been talked to? No. This belief that the only way that we can get results is by hammering and beating ourselves down is not a good thing. I'm not saying don't be, don't challenge yourself. I'm not saying don't push yourself. I'm saying push yourself for the right reasons, not because you're not enough that you're you're trying to fill this empty void, but push yourself because you are enough. You are that person. You are that hero. Believe that about yourself. Believe that you are the person that has the strength, that has the integrity. And you do this because this is who you are. This is who the people who look up to you see you as. Not because you're not good enough and you have to prove that you're good enough. You already are good enough. And when you operate from that, then you just do the things that are aligned. And it's easy. And you're happy from it. So, guys, I hope that was helpful. Again, this will be up on the YouTube channel, Coach Tina B125. You can check it out there. And we will see you again tomorrow night. Have a great day. Bye.